Hi, this is Simon Dennis BSC. I'm the cinematographer of Ratchet, and you're listening to The Goat Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director and owner of BC Media Productions. And this is The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. So today we've got Simon Dennis BSC, uh, one of the cinematographers on Ratchet on uh, Netflix. Of course, one of the most anticipated shows of the year, and it certainly does deliver. And Simon does a great job of explaining, of course, his cinematography and uh, lens choices, camera choices, lighting decisions, filtration, all of it. I love having Simon on. And um, for those of you guys that uh, aren't familiar with Simon Dennis, he also shot American Crime Story, Pose, Peaky Blinders. He did Hollywood, which he came on the show for not too long ago. And and uh, he's just now about to start shooting the new American Crime Story, the Bill Clinton scandal. So he's got a lot of stories to share. And you guys are going to absolutely love this one. So I'm here with Simon Dennis, BSC, the cinematographer, one of the cinematographers for Ratchet on Netflix. Uh, Simon, welcome back to Go Creative Show. So soon, it's only been a couple of months. I know, right? Yeah, it's great to be back. Last time you were on, you were on for Hollywood on Netflix. And you were just telling me before we started rolling that you shot Ratchet actually before that. Yes. So I'd love, I'd love to kind of hear how these two shows work together because they're both um, from the same you know, kind of from the same minds. Yep. Uh, and they're also kind of shot around the same time periods. Yes. And they were kind of shot around the same time. Yes. So I, I'd sort of like to start there a little bit because when you were on for Hollywood, we couldn't really talk about Ratchet because um, it hadn't been released. So talk to me a little bit about how the two shows were really happening at the same time as far as, you know, how you were involved. Well, I think part of it is a little happenstance. It's actually set in exactly the same year, 1947. So Hollywood was 47, Ratchet was 47. So weirdly, segueing from Ratchet into Hollywood was a great thing because we'd already kind of experienced this period and the era. So it's almost like you can imagine Ratchet existing in the Hollywood universe, <laughs> you know, in a weird way. Um, yeah, so that it, it kind of helped a lot because we were dealing with the same sort of tone, the same decor, the same design, the same era. So it was wonderful. Was it the same crew? I mean, were you working with the same art directors and you know production designers and all that? No, it was a pre. It was a kind of a new crew in a way. We had a new production designer for Hollywood for with which was Matthew and Judy production designed. Um, Ratchet, but we had pretty much the same crew as, as in kind of camera grip lighting. Now, both shows are kind of from the mind and the world of Ryan Murphy. And there's yeah. certainly, a, he, he certainly has a particular style. Like every show has its own look, certainly, and it has its own vibe. But yeah. there's something about a Ryan Murphy show when you see it, you know it's his. Uh, and I'd like to kind of get your impression of that. To me, it comes down to three key things, fashion, architecture, and color. That's the three mm. things he rotates around. And I believe, I feel that Ratchet is almost like a sister to the brother of Hollywood. It, everything, uh, you know, and I talked about this on Hollywood before, was everything feels so well preconceived and designed that actually photographing his his scenes are pretty easy. And weirdly, I kind of put color over lighting in a way because it's almost like a fashion kind of show you know it's so many beautiful costumes and obviously hair and makeup and beautiful 360 degree sets you know and, and, and if we are shooting on location they are in the same thing we basically are, don't feel like we're kind of um held down to like a certain kind of parameter of visuals we, we always have a sort of a, a big uh, a big board to play with and a big set to kind of shoot around. So yeah, I think fashion, architecture, and color is for me what Ryan really loves. It's interesting to hear you say that you almost put color ahead of lighting when you're working on a Ryan Murphy show. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, Hollywood had a lot of color theory and Ratchet had definite color theory that was all preconceived. Um, you know, we were dealing with a lot of uh, either costume theory color arcs or lighting color arcs. So we had lighting cues that were actually built into the set. 
Uh, if anyone's seen the show, they'll see that there's a, a big kind of emerald green shift, very much in the, in the tone of Vertigo, Bernard Herrmann and Hitchcock and all that kind of stuff, particularly with the music yeah. cues. And um, But us, on top of that, Ryan also gives his costumes an arc. You know, so he had things like when Mildred's wearing a yellow outfit, it could be conceived as deceit, and then the blue one is more neutral, and then red is more evil, and then white is purity, and green could be conceived as honesty. Um, when we were talking about the... I mean, because Nelson Craig was the the cinematographer that set it up with Ryan and kind of created the world, and I stepped in pretty much halfway through the storyline. But, you know, they had cover shifts. So Nelson was saying, you know, green is signifying lust and red. is a kind of obvious tonal kind of color theory is more directed towards violence because the show has a great balance between violence and psychology and horror and yeah. all those great things. Well, something that really intrigued me about the show is, I mean, you know the Nurse Ratchet character from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And you're kind of thinking like, that she's going to be that character throughout the entire Ratchet series. And it becomes clear right, right away that they, that, you know, you all, your whole team has given her character so much depth and she isn't evil all the time. You know, there are moments, but yeah. not all the time. She's, she falls in love. She has family. I mean, she, there's so much more to her character, and clearly, you obviously have to do that with a series versus a TV, uh, versus a movie. But you did it in so many different ways, and it's interesting to hear you kind of put the the the, the complete you know package of her character in the looking through the lens of color. I think it's really interesting. Mm. I wasn't picking up yeah. on her wardrobe reflecting her mood at the time or her mm -hmm. her character at the time. Um, but that's really interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, when, you know, I obviously know where the arc ends. We all know Cuckoo's Nest. Um, to me, I found that the whole, the whole show indeed has got a lot of very complex cogs within it. You know, you've got a lot of characters hiding from their past and leading double lives. I mean, I mean, Sarah said sort of openly that she felt like her character was in pursuit of survival and almost finding a home. And, and on top of that, you know, the show deals with basically love stories, you know, pretty much between yeah. her and Gwendolyn and what have you. But I, I never felt that she was pure evil. Uh, you know, there's a thing where, it, like, it's, it's like a slash thing. Like, is she an angel or is she a monster? You know? Yeah. Um, is she a cold-hearting tyrant? Is she an angel of mercy? There's so many different layers to the character that I think, weirdly, I think people tapped into and loved about the show because it was a, you know... A, a kind of relatively massive success on Netflix. And it's funny when you follow a character that's that dark and complex uh, and smart and manip she's very manipulative, but I never saw her as being damaged. You know, I think the way that the arc of the story happens with her backstory with Edmund, her foster brother and what have you, there's a reason why she came to be who she is. It's mm. not like she's a kind of like a, just a, a, a mustache twirling villain, you know, I think there's so many layers to that. And, and Ryan is very much behind all of that. Did One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest influence the cinematography at all? And that's actually a question from Jaden Marvel on Twitter. It, I found, yes. I, I mean, there were, I mean, Nelson kind of came forward earlier on and said, look, we're going to probably go down a very much of a Hitchcock kind of route uh, with Bernard Herrmann cues and a little bit of The Shining so once I got into the set and I saw the psychiatric ward, which is basically more like a, you know, four, you know, a five-star hotel, I suddenly, yeah. it suddenly clicked in my mind what Ryan was doing. And I, to me, I was looking at the spatial awareness in Cuckoo's Nest and how the psychiatric and the psychology level was working. Uh, that was a big influence. I mean, I, I love that. It's in my top 10 movies and I even watched it, you know, last month. I could, can't help myself. It's such a fascinating movie on so many levels, and I think that the show kind of apes that. Uh, but yeah, I think I think regarding that question, I would say you know Kubrick was definitely in there. Uh, it's almost like a Kubrickian version of Cuckoo's Nest, so it's much more stylized and you know symmetry and space. Talk to me a little bit more about the spatial um, part of this, like you had mentioned. Uh, what do you mean by that? What were you pulling from Cuckoo's Nest? 
I, I, it, to me, you know, when I take a movie like The Shining, The Shining is a, a, a movie that inverts the genre. So it's, it's a horror movie that is all about bright, open spaces. It doesn't tend to work in shadow. And I love that. And I sort of drew from that, as well as Cuckoo's Nest, the way that Cuckoo's Nest is very much a, a, a day film, where, but it has certain dark psychological kind of subtext. So I sort of was taking a little bit of Cooker's Nest, a little bit of Kubrick, and, uh, you know, there's a little bit of um, uh, Shawshank Redemption, actually, you know, with Ed, Edmund mm. Sell, you know, and there's a little bit of actually, you know, Science of the Lambs <laughs> things. Yeah. So, so and, and, you know, on top of that, Ryan was putting all of these beautiful, rep, like, links to the Cooker's Nest. When you first see Edmund, he's wearing a brown leather jacket and a green T-shirt, which is basically... Um, you know, Jack Nicholson when he first arrives in the cuckoo's nest. And there's bits where Nurse Ratchet, when we flash back to her during the war, she would, she would, um, it's almost like she was putting people out of their misery by smothering them with a pillow. So, so there's lovely little connections. So it's not just a reference for the cuckoo's nest, there was actually story connections. No, way. I'm looking at pictures of Jack Nicholson in that wardrobe right now. Yeah, if you go to the I, first, that, first episode. That is crazy. No, I'm saying, um, yes, I know the first episode when you first see uh, Edmund for the first time. Yeah. But I didn't remember the wardrobe from Cuckoo's Nest. And now looking yeah. at it here, my God, I totally. love stuff like that. It's great. That it's stuff great. is so fun. This is why when you said about lighting, lighting obviously is a very intricate part of story and cinematography. But... For me, the power of cinematography, I think what taps into people's psychology is, and they're aware of it or not aware of it, is color and design. It's, it just goes so far. And then, you know, I would just come in and just finish it off with some lighting. But to me on set, it never felt like that was a priority. Now, when you are working, you know, not even just on Ryan Murphy stuff, but when, when you're working on on shows that have so much design, so much architecture, and you want to see it. Like, does that does that change the way that you think about cinematography? Are you thinking to yourself, okay, I want to be wider. I want to have more in focus. Are you kind of changing the way you approach it because the sets are so amazing? I tussle with this one a lot because when you watch the masters, they, you know, here's the theory. In TV, there's a very formulaic thing, wide, in coverage and yeah. it's like a clockwork thing you, you almost have to like you don't even have to tell the crew they're already setting up a wide shot or they're finding a wide shot or we're finding a wide shot to me i i love the masters who tend to like do my um coverage through story so even though you are completely tempted on all of ryan's sets to do that you've got to pace yourself because you're going to run out of steam very quickly uh, it's Tem like, tempted to do what? what? What did you mean? It's like doing a wide shot of the Sistine Chapel, you know? It's like, there it is, ah. you know, and you go back in and then you go to the another scene, another scene, you're back in the Sistine Chapel and suddenly it's the wide again. To me, that's mm -hmm. not storytelling. To me, it's, it's almost like pacing yourself um, to find the right way to expose the set because sometimes you want to almost start within the characters and then reveal the architecture around them or vice versa. So it's not a, it's something that, yeah, I definitely think a lot about and, and Ryan's sets give you that way of working, particularly with the guest directors who want to structure their episodes around the drive of the story and the characters and the movement and then relying on, you know, technically wide shots, I always question this is like, what is that saying? Is it just telling me about mm. the, the environment that these people are in? How do we frame those characters in that wide? All these things kind of come together. But ultimately, I think what I've taught myself is to pace yourself on how you kind of expose the story, if that makes sense, through the sets. Pace yourself, meaning you're so tempted to reveal those wides. And, and yeah, 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 which is it's a it's a it's almost like a muscle memory that i think is transitioning tv is becoming movies and movies are becoming tv but predominantly we, we now live in a very cinematic universe on tv and netflix so you've got to start to remind yourself where you came from in the sense of uh movie uh movie language 
over TV language, which has been going for decades. And it gets very boring after a while when you start to rely on that. And, you know, I loved, you know, I read an interview the other day with Steve McQueen, the filmmaker, and he never used the words coverage in his movies. He hates the word coverage Mm -hmm. because it straight jackets you into into, um, kind of laziness because so many people around you go, you know, let's just do this set justice and show a wide. But really, that wide will come, but it will come at a time when it's needed, if that makes sense. So it's pacing And it itself, has a lot more impact. For sure. It, if it's paced correctly, it has a lot more impact, for sure. Yes, yes. There was one thing about color in Ratchet, and for people that haven't seen it, there are moments when you had mentioned earlier that it goes completely green, like an emerald green. Then there's also moments where it goes completely red. And yes. I haven't yet, com- I haven't yet finished the entire series, so I'm curious. Like, what? I, I guess I'm curious. What was the decision to, or why was the decision made to go completely emerald or completely red? What is the significance there, and how did that affect the cinematography? Well, it, it really came directly from Ryan, and he had this very, very clear vision of, um, you know, if you study a movie like Vertigo, there's a scene where. Uh, the, the lady is waiting for, you know, Jimmy Stewart to come out of, no, uh, I can't remember exactly the breakdown of the scene, but basically there's a shot where she's silhouetted by a green neon light from outside. It's a very, very kind of classic image. And I kind of latched onto that when he mentioned it and the link with uh, Hitchcock and Vertigo. I think really the, the, the psych- psychology of the colors is, is Ryan sort of pointing you towards um, not necessarily a clean cut kind of, uh, thing because basically everyone in a room will have a different interpretation of the color green of the color red every cinematographer yeah. has got a different you know i remember reading about storaro years ago saying uh red is the color of birth because it's the color of mother and blood you know when mother gives birth it's blood he doesn't necessarily see that as murder or deception or violence he sees it mm. as an actual good thing so the show was complex in that way because Ryan had his own theory and, and and it's almost like if you have your theory intact, then whether people interpret it as the right thing or not is is irrelevant. For me, it was a, just a consistent thing that we were kind of pacing off, you know, playing out through certain key scenes that needed that signifying through color. And, you know, I think on top of that, it was, again, using the 1940s period where, you know, the red shoes and all these beautiful movies were pretty much color coded, you know, and and I kind of I think I talked about that in Hollywood. You know, we were definitely color color theorying on that, but color theory is subjective. You can't make everyone in the room happy with the color shift. They just have to take it as a dramatic signpost, and then in a weird way take what they want from that. Now, knowing that color was going to play a really important role in the cinematography. What camera did you end up testing and ultimately choosing for Ratchet? Uh, it was uh, Nelson brought in the red. We had a red helium and we shot with uh, Ultra Primes. So that was mm. a package that was established. And like I said, I came in halfway through. So it was a handover. Um, so I just sort of, I, vis- I visited the set a few times. to got to see a sense of uh, how they were kind of covering things and you know, obviously the, the, the color thing. Um but yeah, I, I mean, then when I moved on to Hollywood, I kind of shifted to the Sony Venice because I felt that as a camera that's relatively new was dealing with color space, I felt a little bit more um, confidently. Uh, mm. But still, the, the Red Helium did a terrific job. How concerned, well, I, I mean, you certainly were kind of changed the camera package midway through, but was there anything, you know, for maybe Red users right now that are listening to the show that haven't been in situations where color is so important or haven't been in situations where there's so much boldness in the color. Was there something you learned through that experience that would be helpful for, you know, red users out there now? Sure. I mean, every camera these days is pretty much uh, at the top of their game when it comes to color space. Uh, I didn't have any criticisms at all. I think what what the red ad has over other cameras is is resolution. And when you, when you have a... a um, an increase in resolution. We were shooting at 7K with a with a with a I can't remember the compression rate, but it was up there, very high. So when you have a, a a higher chip, you know, a higher resolution, the color space is improved. The higher you go, 
And uh, we we knew that because color would pop out from costumes, from the sets, that it was in it was integral that the camera captured that, and it didn't feel like we needed to fix things or polish things later. So kind of the dailies that we were kind of coming through and seeing were pretty much what you see in the show. You know, nothing's uh, color corrected in a way, if that makes sense. Nothing's sort of, uh, it's all there. So that was really important. And and like I said, I visited set and made sure that I was watching what they were doing and how the intensity of color, when you get, when you get certain color that goes over a certain intensity, particularly when you're working with a single color, it has a strange effect on the digital chip because it almost feels like if if you're too low on those levels, it feels almost like uh, the back focus is off, as it were. You know, it feels like slightly soft. You know, an example being if you're ever doing a scene in a in a in a photographic laboratory, and they pull the cord and the light goes red, you got to make sure that you've got to amp up that red almost three times the level of what you would do because you lose you're losing two primary colors. And when you're mm. losing two primary colors, you're losing technically two stops of, of range in the color space. So you huh. basically, so when we when you see scenes where she's walking down the corridor, that that whole corridor was uh, rigged with all these beautiful LED RGB lights in the in the wall sconces. So on set, it would have probably felt quite blinding, but actually in the camera, it's capturing a beautiful, clean color. Oh, that's interesting. I, but it makes sense. I mean, if you're getting rid of two thirds of your available color, yeah. it, it makes sense that there would be a difference in the stop. So that's that. Yes. I've, I've never, I've never. No one's at least that I remember has talked about that on the show before. So that's good information. I like that. Yeah, thanks. There's also there's there's a really interesting lighting choice on Ratchet that I noticed where you and it's in a few different it's in a few different locations where you have a really, really intense, like daylight almost looking beam of light that lands uh, and it's very narrow and you see it in um, the jail cell um, where Edmund is. You see it in the um, the office, the big like office where the, I can't yes. remember his name, but the, the doctor that runs the hospital. Dr. Hanover's and, office, yeah. That was my yes. favorite set actually. <laughs> oh my God. I, oh, please, I can't wait to talk about the sets. But- there's something about like that is a really strong lighting choice. It's almost blown out. Like you yes. almost can't even see any detail in the whites. I'd love to hear about that decision, even if it weren't yours, um, and how you, you know, I guess how you dealt with that and incorporated it into your cinematography. Yeah, it wasn't an accident. It was all designed. Uh, to me, it was a more of a blooming uh, than a and then a blowout. Um, Dr. Hanover's office particularly almost looks like uh, you're in some kind of strange aquarium. You know, it's like, and then right on top of that, he insisted on having palm tree leaves scattered through the backing and through the uh, shears. So you get this, uh, it was almost like you're in a jungle, you know, uh, when you see Dr. Hanover's office, particularly the wides. Uh, No, that was all completely preconceived and it was all very considered. Um, so for the people that haven't that haven't seen the show, can you just describe what this lighting decision was and, and what like just kind of describe what it is? It's it's it to me from my, my interpretation was it's almost like light is screaming to get into a space, and sometimes it does, and sometimes you get a leak, but then it, but it's almost suppressed, so it's like a suppression of sunlight. So what you end up doing, obviously, you know, on, on top of that with the uh, filtration in the camera, which will kind of bloom highlights is you get this almost dreamlike quality. And, 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 and that was, the, I mean, at some point I was chatting to Ryan and, you know, a couple of things that he was asking me what I thought about the design of the show the so far. And, uh, you know, and I pulled out a word that I realized later was subconsciously from the cookies nest. I just said, it's really peculiar. Like it's just a peculiar <laughs> show. And he looked at me, cocked his head. And he was like, is that a good thing? And I said, ah, yeah, because I've never seen anything like this. Um, yeah. and the other thing was the dreamscape of it all. I fe- every scene almost feels like a weird dream. I don't know if people would interpret that. I feel it like that. It's like a, it's just like you're stuck in this weird void, um, mm. where a lot of peculiar things are happening. A lot of twisted things are happening and it's messing with your brain because it's dealing with psychosis and psychology. 
and psychiatry, you know? Yeah. It, so this, so the, the, the intention through that, uh, the, the sort of light concept you're talking about was very much sort of uh, sewn into that kind of uh, intention of a, of a, of a dreamlike kind of quality. And these are single narrow shafts of light or shaft, I should say, because it yeah. really is kind of just one in the space. And when you first see characters sort of slide through it, I mean, obviously, you know, it's not a mistake, but when you see a character slide through it, it really stands out to you. Yeah. And because it's so narrow, it's almost theatrical in a way. Sure. It, you don't really see that in TV and film. You see it more on stage. Um, I'm just curious how that was described to you. I mean, did you go to set the first time? And you're like, what is with this super hot light that's, pe <laughs> that's peeking through? Like, uh, how was that described to you? It, uh, it, it wasn't actually translated. I, I, it's funny because I, I was sort of sitting quietly in the corner and studying, really. Uh, and Nelson, you know, had set up the kind of rigs and, the you know, all of the lighting. And uh, some shows you end up kind of using a certain budget of lighting. Uh, and with Ryan's shows because they are so expressive, we would use bigger sources, uh, you know, that would really, really punctuate. So when a character, like he says, hits that sun, it's almost like they bloom. And it's, and to me, going back to, you know, my, how my brain works, uh, I would interpret that as being, you know, you're exposing a character. You're kind of almost uh, kind of X-raying them. You know, there's a sequence we did in a barn where it was like a Bonnie and Clyde subplot. Yeah. Where Ed Edmund and his lo lo lover kind of go on the run and they wake up in the morning and they're suddenly surrounded by the police and they go into this side area of the barn and we ended up putting a huge, big, it was technically as, as an 18K lamp. And, uh, you know, I didn't feel like I need to diffuse it. We had a little bit of haze in the air. And there's moments where the light would hit him and bounce into her face, and there's moments where the light would hit her face and hit his. So to me, I, I, I don't know if I should feel that I'm doing that for any particular direct meaning. I, I would say that I, I'm loving that tone in relation to the psychology of the scene. It yeah. just feels right. Sometimes you just feel it. Sometimes, I mean, you could say, well, they could be on the shade side of the building, so maybe it's cold. I felt like it was a very dramatic moment, and it deserves uh, sunlight to be a character that almost exposes them for who they are, you know, or whatever you want to take from that. Well, and not and like not to obsess over this, but I'm so curious why that light was in the jail cell, because my impression of the jail was that we were uh, in the basement. Yeah. Yes. So, like, where uh, where I, was that, and why was that? That was indeed in a basement. The storyline is, yeah, he's right down in the in the in the in the kind of uh, the basement. And uh, the funny thing was that there's so much screen time in that cell that we, when I came in, uh, I felt like anything that I would do is I felt that the lighting should evolve. Not drast drastically, but there's a moment where Mildred walks in, and indeed she's backlit. It doesn't make any sense in in theory of of reality, but to me, I felt that she needed to have that image portrayed of her at that moment. And yeah. I don't know the answer to your question directly. You just have to f feel it, and as long as you tick your own boxes and you've got your own little dogma rules of theory that you ro rotate around all you can do is say i think i'm right <laughs> uh well and if I, I, can, if I can tell you what my theory is and i'm yeah, curious go, go. what you think <laughs> uh, my impression of that whole entire hospital was that you it, it the the whole building is meant to make you feel small and insignificant and the building the ceiling heights are grossly over exaggerated the window sizes are ridiculously tall. Everything is to make you feel small. And they even make a reference to the doctor as being small in stature. And there's all these like weird references to height and like being overwhelmed by the space. And my two favorite episodes are two of the four that you did, the dance and got no strings, mm -hmm. episode five and six. Yeah. Love those episodes. And 
You even see this represented in the puppet show. There's something about this show that puts the main characters in spaces that are top heavy, that make them feel small. And the my theory of the light was that it, I never really knew, was I above ground? Was I underground? I have no, I don't know where I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was something about that being confused and not knowing where you were that I thought made the hospital, you always felt disjointed whenever you were in the hospital. And um, that's what I thought the use of that light was for. And yeah, I mean- could, I mean, you could that's, just be like, yeah, that's totally it. Or you could, <laughs> you could be like, no, I, I don't know. It just was there and we wanted to use it. But th absolutely. those are the feelings that I got in that hospital. Yeah. I mean, a movie that I I, um, I constantly rewatch, even to this day, uh, after, uh, I don't know, 20 years, is The Shining. The Shining has so many layers to oh, it every time you watch exactly. it. Exactly. And to me, The Shining is a great... See, the Cuckoo's Nest movie is not necessarily in that world. It, it, it kind of... It's very documentary in a way. It's very kind of raw. It's kind of... It's very unglossy. Um, yeah. Whereas The Shining is a very void-like movie where, again, you're, you're inverting a genre. That's the first thing that it twists on your head. And I think this does it too because it's playing with horror as well as drama is The Shining, again, it's void. It's a, it's a huge void. Where are we? What, it, you know, it's spatial awareness is, is a great thing. And you can only really have that ability to play with spatial awareness if you've got such beautiful sets that Ryan delivers. And then, yeah, like you say, there is so much height. Normally the sets can be quite low, low level, and you, feel, you don't feel the sense of scale. But for sure, I loved, I loved those moments where you're almost feeling like these characters are just almost being crushed by this psycho psychiatric hospital because it's like, or just, it's almost like they're irrelevant. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the bigger brother in this thing is, is, you know, psychology. And, and, and you, and, and again, you know, Freud can talk about that. I can, but <laughs> I, I know. Uh, you know, and that's why there's so many different ways you can interpret the space, which goes again, to what I said earlier about pacing yourself on how you use those, how you push those buttons at those at those moments. Talk to me about the challenges of lighting for 360 sets. <laughs> uh, it's tough. Yeah, I won't lie. Uh, yeah, it, it's, sometimes you just sort of, you know, it, it, sometimes it's a kind of, you know collaboration with the director. Ryan is very much he's a kind of a brute in a great way when it comes to this. He's like, I want to do this. And you go, okay, I'm going to work with my lighting team and I'll make it work. If you work with a guest director, you can say, can I suggest this or that? When you're talking 360, sure, sometimes I just let it go because I feel that what the audience will be soaking up would be the color and the architecture. Hmm. And if you have to compromise one thing, it would be lighting. But I don't think you always are because, you know, what Ryan's designers always give you on a set, not just windows, they'll give you beautiful practicals. So in the end, mm -hmm. you're almost saying, well, could I just say this is a prac driven scene? And then you hide a couple of lights here and there to make it feel more uh, carved and kind of not so kind of flat. I, I like the challenge of that kind of style of filmmaking. I, I think it almost, you know, people, I was raised with the kind of notion that you had to carve out each scene as you go or each shot, sorry. And then you go back onto the other coverage. But sometimes in this show, because a lot of it was based on psychology and performance, we would often cross shoot, you know, uh, Sophie, who's an incredible actress who plays a character that has multiple personality disorder <laughs> Mm. she's in the in the office and there's there's a five page scene um and this could be a good example really it was in dr hanover's office which is what you said is like lit with this hot sunlight so we ended up basically putting three cameras in a way that we knew that she would come out of one shot into another and i just let i said to sophie i'm just going to get the room ready for you you do what you need to do if you need to kind of run over to this part of the room that's good. And Mike and um, Andrew Mitchell, incredible steady cam operator, was, you know, it's a funny, she, he was trying to keep up with her. And a friend of mine even said after he watched it, he loved the fact that the camera was slightly behind her because it almost felt almost real. It didn't feel rehearsed. So, yep. so to me, that kind of sense of dominance, which is all about performance and power of performance, 
is much more important than how you make every shot look, you know, beautiful. Uh, so what, so like, what is your approach to that? So you're on a set, Dr. Hanover's offers. You said it was one of your favorite sets. Yeah. You're there. You know that the scale of it's really big. You know, it's a 360 set. How, what is your approach to that? Like how, how are you uh, handling it? Well, we handle it in almost times of day. I mean, the, the, if you kind of bolt all the scenes together as a flow, I mean, there was one scene when we did it, felt, it felt like midday. So it was almost like super blue, clean look. And there was times where we would almost make it feel like mid-afternoon, late afternoon, early morning. So those are the things that I was more interested in over than just turn, you know, rigging a set with lights and just turning them on and off, you know, turn them on, shoot, go yeah. home, turn them off. I don't feel that's a journey in any way. I feel that it's a responsibility for the cinematographer to really uh, kind of almost uh, get a sort of an emotional reaction to a rehearsal. And believe it or not, you know, the, the lighting rigs are done in a way where they can, they're all mechanical so they can come down and then move to the left to the right. So I never felt like I was in a stressful thing of constantly uh, going for a very similar look. I would always try to make it shift and feel a little bit different. If that, if, if that answers your question. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, to me, the, the, the true answer to me about uh, light. I mean, I grew up where, uh, light is talked about in an artificial sense, but light isn't an artificial kind of theory or or, or existence or 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 a being. It, it's we all study light in the morning. There's light in the morning. It's sunlight, and there's practicals in your house when the sun goes down, and then there's moonlight. So really, it's not that complicated. The the trick is trying to choose which tonal light suits which tonal scene. Mm. And again, like I said earlier, it's not a cop out, but it's just a gut instinct you have to trust yourself on. I want to circle back to that scene you were just referencing with um, Sophie. I don't remember her character's name. Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, yes. She is, you know, experiencing multiple personalities on camera as it's happening. Um, and she's completely unhinged. And it was, again, like I mentioned, those those two episodes are really, the dance was, I think, the one that she was, that was her episode, the dance episode, correct, right? Correct. Um, just, I absolutely love that that episode. And I think what what I wanted to talk to you about is from, for the, uh, how, how, what, can you talk to me about the way that you approach filming a character who is crazy? I mean, <laughs> how do you do that? Because there, there are certainly things you can do to make someone look crazier in their cinematography, mm. uh, in your cinematography, rather. Um, so I'm curious, what, were there techniques that you used to help amplify the fact that she was completely insane and, and having basically a breakdown yeah. in the scene? Yes, we did. Uh, you know, there's one school of thought is you do the Terry Gilliam, you put the nine mil lens on and you do a Dutch tilt. Okay. You know, that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> Yes. To me, to me, uh, I mean, that's very expressive. So what we did, or what I'd sort of try to do in, I mean, that scene in particular, there's a few of them, is we cross the line all the time, mm. which is obviously a cardinal sin with TV and or any form of language because it confuses people. So when me and, say, Dan Minahan or, you know, would rehearse the scene, uh, and he was almost, it almost fell off his tongue too. I just said, Dan, wouldn't it be fascinating if we have like a neutral camera and a camera that crosses one line and then the other line? And that's three personalities you could cut and use mm -hmm. rather than um, trying to perceive it through camera work or camera movement. I felt like it was almost a spatial thing where you almost felt like you're jumping to this side of the room now and it's like, wow. So I made sure that, you know, the editorial has got the notes that we weren't making a mistake, that we were doing it completely deliberately, and we only did it on her side. Um, so when she popped out of a character into another character, yeah, we kind of crossed the line. And it, and I and I looked back at the scenes and I thought, wow, it was a not necessarily a bold decision, but it, it worked for me. Well, what I loved so much about it is it wasn't necessarily a super bold decision. I watched mm. that scene or those scenes a couple of times because I was, I was really intrigued by how I clear, obviously you had an actress that was giving you an unbelievable performance. So 
there you yeah. go. That there's yeah. the whole story right there. <laughs> but but even like I thought you guys were really like I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It was like you were really respectful of the condition of mental illness in a way. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't ham-handed at all. It was very realistic feeling. You let the scene just take place and you did make the audience feel off a little bit, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like you said, the Dutch angle and the nine millimeter. It yeah. was like respectfully done in a way, if that makes any sense. Yeah, thank you. That means a lot. That means a lot. I felt, you know, I feel like, you know, you need to be mature about these things. And, um, and like, you know, the, we use the word consideration. It, it was, a, you know, Sophie is just incredible. She's like a light switch. You know, she's completely normal backstage and great and chatty. And then boom. And after the first scene, I think it was an earlier scene we did with her, I suddenly read her sort of method in a way, not method acting, but method in the sense of her movement and how she would kind of, you know, twist her head or what have you. So... Uh, that's where the kind of line crossing thing is that I kind of knew even it wasn't just crossing the line. She was almost playing to uh, other areas of the room. And, uh, but yeah, I think we were, we were all very considerate of her. I mean, it, it, she, it was so funny. Every time she came into a scene, I suddenly found, I suddenly felt like this presence over my shoulder. And I turned around and there was like 12 crew members just watching her performance. That's how mm. powerful it was. And that again, yeah was, uh, you know, it ricochets through the whole set. So it wasn't just me, it was Dan, the director, it was, or Michael Uppendahl, or, you know, everyone in the space was very considerate. Not to say that she was a standout. We were considerate on at many levels, you know, even M Mildred can be considered this way of how we photograph her. But uh, that's an example, yeah, that, that was pretty special. Can you talk to me a little bit about the way that you approach scenes with blood and gore and violence? I close my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am the squeamish person you you can imagine. Um, the gore, well, actually, the gore the gore came in a lot in the first I would say first three episodes. I mean, I do remember actually a friend of mine turning it off in episode two with the eyes picked through the eyeball, you know. And I, I yeah, I, myself, I was definitely like, oh, oh no, no. Even I look away, and I, I I can't I can't deal with that needles. Um, you know, the blood factor was fine, you know. Um, but I don't know if I can answer that question because I, I ended up doing a lot more psychological blood, as it were, than physical yeah. blood as the story moves on. But I'm totally aware of what you're saying. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of, um, it's very unflinching the way they'll do it. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, my dad, my dad was like, oh, I loved it when the, when the priest got the ice pick through the eyeball. And I was like, yeah, dad, I, I skipped that scene. <laughs> <laughs> or I just fast forwarded that moment because you know it's coming. I don't know. I mean, oh, that's cute. Your your dad is watching your work and oh, commenting on it. I like. He, my mum and dad have just discovered Netflix, literally. So they are <laughs> binging all of the shows, Hollywood, even past shows are done, which is be, it's a very touching thing. Very touching. Um, that is so. How do <laughs> yeah. how do they react to it? Do you get embarrassed when they're? Yeah, well, my mum and about? dad, you, you can read their body language. My dad's getting giddy like a five-year-old, and my mum's like, ooh, that was just horrible. And uh, so, so you know, that, that I love that dichotomy and that kind of, like, thing of watching both of their – because they come from a different kind of world in a way of their, what their tastes are. And, and I can learn a lot from, you know, my mum and dad, actually, about, you know, uh, they haven't said it at all about these shows, but they would say things like, oh, you know, son, I, I love that scene that you did but i just didn't believe that character you know things like that mm. things that you don't really analyze that level because you're just trying to do the best you can you know to tell the story it's yeah. good that they but, give you their their honesty instead of just like oh it's it's so good simon it's so good i love it <laughs> yeah i know i know <laughs> yeah i'd like to talk to you a little bit about the way that you handled the dance scene in episode mm. five because the whole, it was episode five, right? Or was it six? Yes, I'm getting, correct. Yeah, episode five. Dance, okay. five. Because there's something that really, uh, there's something really interesting that happens in that episode where there's this upcoming dance. The whole, the whole episode is leaning towards this dance. You know, something bad is going to happen at this dance. Mm -hmm. You don't know exactly what it is, but you know, it's not going to go off well. Mm -hmm. And you're building tension throughout the whole thing. 
And I'd love to I'd love to talk to you about the way that you build tension in cinematography. How did you handle the shots, the lighting, the the pacing in scenes where it's supposed to be this fun moment, but you mm -hmm. know as a viewer that it's not going to turn out well, and of yeah. course it doesn't. Yeah. Um, so can you can you talk to me about how you how you handle scenes like that where you just know things are off and it's going to go bad? Yeah, sure. Uh, Michael Oppendahl, terrific, terrific director. Um, basically, it was all about preparation. Again, kind of like the end sequence where I took some time out with the director to walk it through. We went into the space. We had we had, uh, we started actually with a floor plan, and we had these little head. Uh, little characters that we would move around like chess pieces. And strangely enough, early the early concept was um, Ryan wanted a, a dance floor right in the middle of the space that was checkerboarded black and white, very much like a chessboard, mm. which is a huge That's sort cool. of very cool thing, right? In the end, last uh, the last hour he pulled it. Uh, but what it got me thinking Why? about was, well, I just think he was wanted to, it, it felt too dominant. It felt like he wanted to use the space in general of that area. So you're moving around the space. But what it did do is help me and Michael think about chess and, and how chess moves and how characters would move from one area to the other and how you're building up tension. And um, yeah, so we, we did a lot of hours preparing for that. We did a massive rehearsal sequence where we mapped out all the characters we, we didn't storyboard it, but I did a lot of Artemis pictures and, and broke down how we would structure it all. It's, and going back to what I was saying to earlier about the discipline of using wide shots, this isn't a sequence where you can just do one master wide shot. It just doesn't yeah. happen that way. Um, yeah. So I remember it was a lot, a lot of coverage, a lot of steady cam work, but a lot of things where we would fluently move from one zone to the other to pick up characters to connect their geography. And then the moment Edmund comes in, you're in a whole different thing where there is definitely an uneasiness. There's a lot of, um, you know, where he has the razor blade hidden under the napkin. Um, and I think, you know, going back to the king, we always went back to Hitchcock and studied the way he would pace sequences. Um, I mean, maybe uh, Rope is a good example. You know, it's a spatially aware uh, a movie in one set but there's something about the building of tension through the camera moves and the and the coverage. Well, not coverage, really. It's actually more about how you link things in a space. And, and, and on top of that, the underlining tension. So it was, it was, it was complicated, but it, and it took a while. When you know that that scene's coming, you're planning it. Are there certain lenses you choose, focal lengths, um, certain mm. camera motion you're deciding on? What what are the tips and tricks from your perspective to make a scene have so much kind of tension building up? Well, uh, first thing I would say is we would probably work around the same focal lengths. We didn't feel we needed to be biased. Uh, we we just almost needed to be um, within the, the you know the cameras on Ryan shows invariably are in this, the very personal space of a character. So I didn't feel like it was. Uh, I think with all the things going on, we didn't feel like we need to kind of multi-layer it with different, you know, focal lengths. Um, uh, but what the one thing I kind of, I mean, going back to lighting, the one thing that I, um, I kind of threw in was they have a disco ball, which is strangely a, a, so it's a surreal invention because we were going, is there a disco balls back in 1947? Well, what we did was I made sure that I had this disconcerting feel where, you get that kind of rolling disco light that's kind of that's mm. going around the space, and you know, again, that's always prevalent and it's always moving. And I kind of enjoyed that thing of it being not just a, a, a big open space that has just a neutral lighting concept. I felt that the spinning of that was there. On top of that, we also played with shutter a little bit more than focal lengths when when um, Doctor Handover goes off and has his little injection, his little boost, he comes back yeah. in and, and suddenly we're into a higher shutter speed. So it feels more erratic. So when he's dancing, he's doing that kind of crazy 1940s dance. Um, we wanted to make that feel like we're in his space too. So in his psychology by using shutter speeds and everything's very vibrant. Um, 
But yeah, it's a, it was a few things. And like I said, it took a long, it was a big, big, big sequence that we just knew we just couldn't play neutrally. It had to be so well kind of thought through. No, I was going to say, if, if it worked for you as a litmus test, then I, I'm like, wow. Yeah. I loved it. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think the whole show is an is an exercise in restraint in a way, which, I mean, Ryan Murphy's stuff really, I don't think is necessarily known for restraint because people no. see so much, you know, it's, they're kind of extreme, but the cinematography kind of is in a way. It's, I think a lot of the boldness of it is in the art direction and the set design mm-hmm. and all that. Um, and certainly is, is true for Ratchet too, but I don't know. I just feel like this show, particularly your episodes, have a lot of restraint and restraint in the cinematography and mm-hmm. really, really, you're not just throwing everything, you know, at the wall and seeing what sticks. It, right. it really feels like you're very purposeful with all of your moves, focal lengths. All the decision seems very, very purposeful to me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. In our last couple of minutes, I want to talk about filtration mm-hmm. on your lenses. The show looks really crisp, mm-hmm. really clean. Mm-hmm. Um, and you mentioned a little bit earlier too, uh, having some filtration that gave almost like a glow or a halo on that hard light that mm-hmm. I'm clearly obsessed with. <laughs> so, um, can, talk to me a little bit about the kind of filtration you're putting on those lenses. Yeah, uh, well, Matt Nelson set up the camera package, but it was a uh, it, the if, for people out there, it was the Mitchell filtration. Uh, the Mitchell is actually a little bit more of an old school um, filtration system. Um, that comes from, I mean, there's a lot of new filtration now with digital that does a lot of great tricks. You can make highlights bloom, but not the skin tones affected and what have you. Uh, so, yeah, so I knew when I walked in that Nelson had made that decision. Again, it will just simply isolate high, highlights or the higher end of your light spectrum so it would bloom, but it doesn't affect any midtones. Um, mm. And, on yeah, on top of that, it just gives you... It's, it's a funny thing because some people do it these days to hide the digital kind of uh, issues that you are trying to get more to a filmic look. To me, this was more of a uh, deliberate choice to uh, tap into that kind of, like I keep saying, and I'm obsessed by, is the dreamscape thing. Like it feels very, yeah. very uh, thing. And I, I, I think over other shows, we were shooting again with more deeper focal lengths generally. Uh, which might be kind of obvious to a lot of people. I mean, you know, to Joe Public, they'll just be watching a show. But, you know, as w- with the filtration and then the focal lengths where you can shoot a lot deeper because the sets are so beautiful, you don't want to camouflage or hide that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of very fast lenses out there now. But, I, you know, when I walked in, I was like, wow, you know, this it's almost like we needed to be doing the Citizen Kane thing, you know. Mm. It's like, it's it's like layer you know make the dimension of the sets feel completely three-dimensional whereas when you're blurring a background on top of filtration you're almost losing the impact of the architecture and 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 what they're trying to say you know in that space were you shooting a little bit more closed than normally no i mean for t-stop wise it was probably around two eight two four sometimes five six um we never really ventured into this super um compressed vocal design uh you know i think we touched on this with hollywood again it's like um when you're raised a cinematographer you find all these fantastic lenses that are giving you fantastic texture but i'm still a fan of the shining you know citizen kane you know uh you know you could, even cuckoo's nest you know cuckoo's nest is not necessarily a you know it just feels like you're 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 giving due service to the sets over the uh, stylization of cinematography in general, you know, kind of like what would Ratchet look like anamorphic, you know, I don't think it would be the same show at all. To me, going back to what I first said is like fashion, architecture and color. And and you don't want to hide those three components and you don't want to kind of like blur it in any way. Well, the show is Ratchet. It's on Netflix, the whole Season is available now, and you mentioned uh, uh, something about season two. I was mm. I was actually going to ask you. Uh, I I I still I haven't seen the last episode yet, so I'm not completely f- done with it. No. But both Hollywood and Ratchet, at least so far with Ratchet, 
it almost feels like they could be standalone seasons mm -hmm. or a series. I mean, it, they could go either way. Yeah. Um, I mean, what's what's going on with them? Is there definitely a season two for Ratchet or even Hollywood? Uh, uh, so I read this in the press. I don't, I'm not going to hear this directly from Ryan. And the press is saying that he had a four season arc that, that ends with Cuckoo's Nest. Now, this is an IMDb thing. I don't know what's true these days. Uh, sure. I definitely know that he would go straight forward into a second season without any spoiler alerts. They kind of set that up in a way. Okay. It becomes much more about uh, a sibling rivalry. I, I, this is a guess for me too, but I, I think you know all those theorists out there are, are kind of pointing towards that. Whereas season one was much more about setting up the kind of architecture of all these, of the world that he wants to kind of put you in. So who knows? I mean, it's definitely left, not open-ended, it's left in a way that it tells you where it's going to go. Uh, even from the last shot or shots, because there's a beautiful way that they send off the thing with an open road and a dissolved shot of Mildred Ratchet in profile. It's just that I just when I saw that, I was like, wow, beautiful. And that's well, I'm watching that episode when. tonight, so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for you. Simon Dennis BSC, of course, you can find him. Uh, we're going to put links to all of his stuff in our show notes. Um, and also, you can enjoy his work. He shot Hollywood, Peaky Blinders. He has episodes of Pose, American Crime Story, The Politician, and of course, Ratchet and more. What's next for you, Simon? We are doing the Bill Clinton scandal. For American Crime Story? Yes. Oh, yes. nice. Yes. We're a few weeks away from shooting. Uh, obviously, it's an un... It's a... It's a, you know, difficult time to not worry about too much about COVID. You know, we are in a very tight vacuum on the sets and we've got a lot of safety. Uh, but yeah, we're gearing up to go in a few weeks. Um, and yeah, it's like anything with Ryan. It's the, sh it's the story that you know, but it's definitely a lot you don't know. So it's, Oh, it, I it, love it, the American crime stories. So it's They're gonna, so good. It's going to be the full circle for me because I came to America three years ago to do the, the Versace assassination story. So... Yes. I'm back I'm back in a genre that I really love, which is true crime. So I'm very excited. That is Everyone's fantastic. Are you are you quarantining ahead of filming right now? We are we uh, the way that we work is we get tested three times a week. So Okay. So, so you don't need to do like the two week quarantine before you film. No, no, we're all tested three times a week. It's very it's it's uh checkpoint Charlie at Fox Studios, I tell you. It's like a Roland Emmerich movie when you drive in. You know, really? Yeah, it's like button down. How do you mean? Well, it's like uh, you know, you get temperature tested when you walk in through the gate. You get temperature test when you're in the office. Uh, they clean door handles when you walk out of a space. All these things. We did a test shoot last week with uh, with the cast, and it was our first experience. Well, my first experience, particularly on COVID, you have a mask, and then a, a, you have a a shield on top of the mask. It's a very different environment to work in. And creatively, it's, 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 you have to rethink your process. It's, mm. it's gonna, That's what I was going to ask. So, so you do feel like things are changing. For, so that, like, did you know, like, did scripts change? Did shots change? Like, did things need mm. to change from a creative standpoint uh, mm. to be able to work within COVID? No, it was, it, it was more of a thing where you're all... Um, dressed up in all the, you know, the, the safety gear. And so little things that you don't even think about, like just simple communication, like talking through two layers of a mask and a shield yeah. to an actress who I have to be six feet apart from, you don't think about those things. So it was a great thing. I mean, I have a great friend that was on, um, he did, uh, this is probably a few weeks back now, he did uh, Macbeth, the Coen brother movie, and what they did was they did two days of just role playing shooting with mm. with stand-ins just so crew could get used to the language of covid and what it restricts for you and how you might want to rethink things you know for instance second team walks into the scene they sit down in the chair you're going to light them they've got a mask on how does you know how do you light something yeah. you can't see so i went to production i said i don't know if this is a crazy idea but do they have clear masks and they went away and a day later, they said, we've done the research, we've got clear masks. And I was like, oh, God, thank God. But if so, it does set up rules for you that you have to comply by. Obviously, everyone's on set not wanting to put anyone in danger. So there's no moaning. 
the first thing I noticed, there's no moaning. You just have to deal with it and you have to think outside the box a little bit. Uh, but it's a good thing, you know. It tests you in many other ways on top of shooting another Ryan Murphy show. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm, I, we're all rising to it. And, and, and you know, the, the morale is very high. We, had, we ended up the test shoot day, you know, in a very good place. So we felt very happy. I did my first studio shoot this week since March. We've right. shot in, on, in houses and, and businesses and just like actual, you know, locations yep. since then. But this is the first time back in the studio. And it was just, it's just so nice. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, you need the masks and the shields and all that. But like, there's just such a good vibe in there. Like everyone was so excited yes. to be working and to, it just, it was cool. There was a, a real camaraderie to it. Yeah, I did a I did a test a few weeks back at Panavision uh, with one of the remote heads and I met the focus puller and the DIT for the first time. And we did the test, it took about 20 minutes and then we spent four hours just talking because we realized psychologically, <laughs> yeah. we've, we've done the Zoom thing, but we've never been in a space with two other people. So we were just talking and talking and talking. And it's like that on set. Everyone's, there's a great bubbly vibe to it all. Um, no one's getting any work done. They're all yapping. No. Producers uh, must be pissed. <laughs> exactly. And it obviously is putting pressure on finance. But I, I tell you this much, I would sooner be in a button down studio that's tested three times a day, three times a week, than go to a restaurant. You know, I know for mm. sure that I'm in a much safer environment. Uh, even maybe being at home, you know, you just know everything's yeah. sanitized and they're not taking any risks, not one tiny risk. And we have COVID officers on set and they, they tell you, it's kind of like the, uh, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of, um, you know, the wrestling ring or the boxes. When they kind of start to get too close too much, he comes in and he's like, six feet, please, six feet. <laughs> he's like, because yeah. you, you forget because your, your muscle memory is just to be in touch with everyone. Of course, everyone's not seen each other in six months. So you're like, Hey, dude. And you go to hug somebody and you can't. So it's super surreal. But yeah, like you yeah. say, it's great to be back working and, and it's great to be kind of creating again. It's lovely. Well, I love it. I'm glad that you're out there. I'm so excited to see this new crime story now. Now I'm yeah. like already beyond ratchet. I'm like, <laughs> crime story. I want it. I want it. Yeah. Simon Dennis, thank you so much for coming on Go Creative Show. And you have to come back. You have to promise us you'll come back I promise. for American Crime Story. For sure. For sure. Yeah. I'd love right. to. Perfect. Perfect. Anything you want to plug before we go? Uh, just see the show. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Enjoy it. A company man <laughs> plugging the show and not his own Instagram. I like oh, it. Oh, yeah. I like it. Every time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Thank you. All right. I want to thank Simon Dennis for coming on Go Creative Show, back on Go Creative Show, to talk about Ratchet. Clearly a show that I was obsessed with. And you guys can check it out for yourself right now on Netflix, Ratchet on Netflix. I also want you to uh, follow our great producer, Connor Crosby. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And Matt Russell, who mixes and masters and makes the show sound so good. He and his team are always there behind the mixing board on all of these episodes and all of the work that I do with BC Media Productions, too. I love those guys. And you can find them at gainstructure.com. And of course, on Twitter at Gain Structure. And all things go create show at gocreativeshow.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. And of course, subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. And of course, our sponsors, MZ Education for Creatives and Post Lab, Stress-Free Collaboration and Final Cut Pro and Premiere. Without them, the show would not exist. So please support those that support us. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.